We're going to continue in our uh, series called Overcome, talking about the life of David. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word of God. I pray that today, Jesus, this message would transform our hearts and renew our minds. God, that we would, we would understand how you feel about us and the way that you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. How many you know that uh, last week we talked about David, and I hit for a few minutes on David not being chosen by his father to come as one to be elected as king. And I was preparing and I was moving on from the story and getting into the next part of David's life. And as I started to prepare, I, I couldn't get, the Lord was like, go back. And I said, I don't want to talk about this again. How many know when the Lord starts talking to you, you just do what he says? And he says, I want you to look a little deeper because I want you to hit a little harder this issue about David not being chosen. I want you to look a little deeper. And I did. And here's what I realized. I want to talk today about the broken you and the chosen you, because everyone is broken. Pastors, I did not come out of my mother with a halo over my head, and when I was four years old, I wasn't like parting the water in the bathtub. I'm not, I didn't walk on water, I, I was just a guy with hurt and pain and trouble like you, and the Lord said, I'm going to choose that guy. Why, why, Lord? My brothers are buffed. They have cool hair. They're handsome. I broke seven bones before I was 12 years old. I was crazy. And why would you choose a guy that even my math teacher said, you'll probably not do much with your life, is what my math teacher told me. And the Lord looked down and said, perfect. I'm going to choose that guy. And he tends to do that. He chooses the runt of the litter. He chooses people that are messed up. Moses, a murderer, a thief, a a troubled person, and then all of a sudden, the Lord says, I'm going to use you. And so Israel's history, I want you to hear this. At the time that David was maybe 14 years old, and he's going to be anointed to be king, at, at about, about that moment in the life of Israel, what was going on in the nation was this. Saul, their president, had turned his back on God and was saying, uh, he was actually turning to witchcraft, and he was turning to, to occultic things. And the Lord was like, well, i got to choose another guy. The priests at that time, the guys who ministered in the house of the Lord, were corrupt and leading the children of Israel astray. The nation itself had said, we do not want God to lead us. That's what they said. And in the midst of this trouble that's on Israel, the Lord chooses a weapon to help in that time. And how many of you know that our nation is probably not in the best of places? If you believe that it's in a wonderful place, you're living in la-la land somewhere. We are trillions of dollars in debt. We have laws that we're starting to make that are cray-cray. Target, the bathroom, the, man, the men. I feel like a girl today. I'm going to go in the girl's bathroom. Are you kidding me? That's going to open up so much trouble. You watch. You watch. There's going to be all kinds of stuff that's going to come from this that's not going to be holy. And we always think, well, the answer is a, a, a better structure, more government, more this. And God looked at a nation that was corrupt and going down the tubes and said, I have a solution. I have an answer. And would you like to know what the answer is? Here was the answer. A 14-year-old kid that had a heart after God. That was the answer. The answer was, I have found in David a man after my own heart. And now he didn't become king at 14. How many know that? It took a little time for God to develop him. I want to go back to 1 Samuel 16, verse 1. This is what it says. So think about it. Israel is in a very bleak, bleak place. And the Lord said to Samuel, the prophet, how long will you grieve over Saul? Because God had rejected him. Since I have rejected him from being king over Israel, fill your horn. Now watch, I underlined this in my Bible. Fill your horn with oil and go. And I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for my, myself a king amongst himself. Watch this. Get your horn. Now, we don't do this in our culture and all. Get your horn and fill it with oil. Now, the prophet knew that when God said, take that horn and fill it with oil, the prophet knew something big was coming. This is a big moment, because in the Old Testament, they would use oil to anoint things and set it apart, even furniture that was in the house of God. And they would take the oil and say, the, the, this one is set apart for God. And so Samuel knew something big was coming. Bump down to verse 4. So Samuel did what the Lord commanded him, and he went to Bethlehem. Verse, uh, verse 6. So he calls all of Jesse's sons together, and when, he, and, and when they came in, he looked on Eleb and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his presence or his appearance 
but on the height of his stature because I've rejected him. For the Lord sees, not as man sees. For man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Isn't it true? Men look on the outside. When I met my wife, many, many, 28, 29 years ago, when I met my wife, I had to go back and do math. Uh, when I saw her, I didn't go, wow, what a woman of integrity. What a sweet woman. I looked at her and went, well, she's hot. <laughs> Why? Because men look where? On the outside. God looks on the heart. And so he's warning the prophet. He says, yeah, Eleb, he's big and buffed and he's amazing. But don't look at that. I want you to look at the heart. I've got my guy here that I'm going to use. And all the sons passed before him. And watch what happens. Uh, let's go to verse 11. Then Samuel, the prophet, said to Jesse, are all your sons here? And he said, and this is what I studied this week, and I got stuck on this one little word. And this is what his father said. There remains yet the youngest, but, there's always a but, isn't there? Behold, he's keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him. For we will not sit down until he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And all the ladies said, Amen. <laughs> and the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. And Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. Verse 11. The father didn't even consider him it literally says I underlined the word in my Bible the small word but because when we look on the outside when we start to look at things through life through the lens of this we'll have a lot of buts in our life well I'm not, I, I'm okay but I'm a Christian but see we'll always have a disqualifier in our life and David you got to imagine now I, I can't go too deep into this because Scripture doesn't say this, but I'm going to take just from what happened here that maybe David, as he was growing up as a child, that maybe his father didn't see him quite as he should have. Would you agree? He didn't invite him to the anointing party. All your sons, I need to see your kids. One of these guys is going to be the president. And he says, well, where's your youngest? Where, where, do you have any more boys? He goes, yeah, but, but he's just a shepherd. He's, it's no big deal. Go get him. Brings him in. Watch what happens. He takes the oil out of his horn, he pours it, and he lathers David, this 14, 15-year-old boy, and anoints him with oil and says, you're going to be the, the, the king of Israel. A little heavy when you're 14 years old, huh? What? Watch. Do you think, now just conjecture this for a sec, do you think that maybe David had some father wounds in him, relational wounds from his dad? I do, I think so, because here's why. I was with Athan Wimberley and Noah Wimberley, and we were talking, who are our youth pastors, and I started talking to them. I said, I think David had father wounds. Because if you look at David's life, his children were not good. David's kids had problems. How many would say yes? There were some issues with David's kids. Why? Because I think David had the same father wounds that he passed on to his kids. I, I, I do, when I read it, I go, man, something's up there with David, yet, yet he was a man after God's own heart. Do you ever feel like there's a burning heart inside of you to love God, and yet there's so much crud that you're hanging on to, that you're kind of stuck between two places? Anybody ever feel that way besides me? No family's perfect. I told my son, I'm saving money so that when you grow up, I can pay for therapy for you. Because <laughs> there's, no there's no perfect family. No perfect family. Every person in this room, I guarantee you, everyone in this room has a father wound or a mother wound or a relational wound or something that happened in your life. I guarantee it. Watch. I was playing golf on Friday with a guy from the church who had a birthday party and there was a bunch of us that went playing on Friday. How many of you remember Friday? Freezing cold and rain was out. I mean, I literally said, and so there was a clump of, I'm almost 49 in a couple months. I'm going to be 49. And uh, the other guys were 50, 51, and 52 that was in the group. And the younger guys all went in their own group. And by hole number seven, every one of us older guys were, my back, my knee, my, oh, the cold. We wanted to quit, right? So we pull up to the uh, snack bar, and we're ordering food. And I look over, and I see this dog. And I wanted to be a veterinarian when I was a, a little kid. I love animals. I, 
I, I have a heart for animals, and so I wanted to be a veterinarian. And I saw this dog, and immediately, no one else even sees the dog. I look at this dog, and he's kind of looking at me. And, and like like he's, he caught me. And I went over to him to pet him, and I noticed that he, he wouldn't look at me, and he backed off. And I go, ooh, this dog's been kicked. And so I had my wrap, chicken wrap with the little avocado roll cover thing. And in my mind, I'm thinking, do I eat this or do I give this to this dog? And so I said, we'll share. <laughs> so I ripped the piece off and I threw it to him about where the front row is. And I threw it and he ate it. He looked at me and then I threw it a little closer. And pretty soon that dog was right here. And I would tear off a piece and I would set it in front of me and he would not come. I would push it one inch that way and he would come. And I was like, man, this poor dog, what's happened to this dog? Is somebody kicking you, boy? That's what I said. And I said, well, and I reached out, you know, like this, flat-handed, because you don't do this to dogs, because I don't want to be bit. And I reached my hand out like this, and instantly he ran back to the, where he was. And I was like, ah, oh, man, this is, and everyone else was like, let's go! What's that dog, what's that, the dog whisperer? Let's go. <laughs> What's going on, buddy? You depressed? You know, so I'm talking to him. <laughs> and I got up, and I was walking back to the cart, and this is what I heard the Lord say to me. There are so many people who I've asked to come to me and I've asked to have great relationship with, but they're so wounded by their relationships. They're so afraid that they never receive all that I have for them, and they never quite come. They come. They, they come to church, and they, they do the thing, but they're, they're not really coming to me. They're playing the part, and the Lord loves that we're at church, by the way. But I go to Crunch, and I went to Crunch for four, four weeks, and I worked out for four weeks. <laughs> Did my thing. And my wife one day said, oh. It's not how she moves or talks. But. <laughs> oh, your stomach? I see a little ripple, a little cut there. And I was like, that's right, baby, that's right. I went on vacation, <laughs> ate everything I wanted, haven't been back to the gym in a month. Guess what? I, I hear nothing from her anymore. <laughs> and here's what I was thinking, like, I drive by Crunch all the time. I go to the mall where Crunch is. I look at Crunch. I've been in Crunch without working out. Guess what? No transformation. Because you can go and you can see and you can look, but unless you get in, you won't be transformed. And I want you to catch this verse. This is such, man, the Lord hooked me up with this this week. It, 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 it shattered me in a good way. So many of us, what if David would have said, I didn't get invited to the party? What a jerk, Dad. And he walked out the door and decided to live in bitterness for 40 years instead of, watch this, Letting the Lord use him even as a broken vessel and as a messed up man. He came and he said, okay. And if you look at David's life, throughout his life, he stayed in the presence of God. He stayed in the word of God. And over his life, those things changed and he became transformed. Listen to this verse. How many of you ever heard of the term, the anointing breaks the yoke? If you've been in church for a long time, we say that all the time. The anointing breaks the yoke. And I've always wondered, what is that? So I went to scripture, look at this, Isaiah chapter 10, verse 27, it shall come to pass in that day that his burden will be taken away from your shoulder and his yoke, what, do you know what a yoke is? A yoke, it's not the egg, it's not an egg. A yoke is a big wooden thing that they used to put on livestock and clamped it down so that it could pull them in their little carts and do field work and all that stuff, so that's a yoke. And the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing oil. Now, I did a big study, and some of you are going to be upset today, because I found out that the New King James Version of that translation is not a good translation. It does not mean oil. It is not anointing oil. That's not what it says. Just like King James wanted his name in the Bible, so James in the New Testament, it got put in there, but his name was really Jacob. How many of you named your kid James? Now you've got to go change the kid's name. Watch. The true story, by the way, about, about that name. Listen to this in the ESV version. This is, the, this is the proper translation. 
In that day, his burden will depart from your shoulder and his yoke from your neck, and the yoke will be broken because of the fat. I read that and I said, well, that's horrible. That's a terrible translation. And the Lord said, no, that's the right translation. So I started studying it, and here's what it is. The yoke will be destroyed because of the fat. What does it mean? The yoke will be broken, watch, because you grow so healthy that it destroys the yoke. It's this picture. A yoke gets put on an ox. The ox goes in the field and eats and eats and eats and eats and eats and gets healthy and gets fat. And literally, the growth of the ox, the fat, breaks the yoke off of them. Matter of fact, the word is destroys the yoke. I don't want a yoke broken. I want it destroyed because I don't want it to heal and I don't want it to be put back together again. Watch this. So David, the anointing oil, comes upon him. That's the picture here. And in his life, if you watch David's life, he was always with the Lord. He was always in the field worshiping. He was always, even throughout his, his presidency, his kingship, he was always inquiring of the Lord and in the house of the Lord. You look at his life, no matter what happened, up, down, sideways, he was in the presence of the Lord praying and worshiping. And what happened in David's life is he became transformed. Watch this. If you don't get this, then I can't help you. He became transformed by the intake of the truth of the word of God by feasting on the things of Jesus and on the things of the word and on the things of the spirit of God. And the bondage that was on his life from past wounds broke. Thank you, Ken. Watch, I've been at services where I've prayed for people and I've seen bondage broken off of them. That's awesome. But then I've seen it come back on them. And I go, you're not doing the disciplines. You're not going to crunch, are you? You gotta stay fed. You gotta stay in the presence of the Lord because the broken you is the chosen you. He has chosen you just as you are. He knows you're jacked up. He knows your family's a mess. He knows your dad was weird and your mom was weird. Maybe they weren't, but somebody was in your life that caused pain. And now you live your life like that dog. You're around, but you don't wanna participate. And the Father's saying to you today, when you get into my presence and my word gets into you and you begin to go after me. You see, if you're coming here and believing that just because you came to church that it's transforming you, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I've been in churches, I've preached in churches where there's 15,000 people in a sanctuary. And I've literally said to the Lord, Lord, man, is this amazing or what? And he's like, no, not, not too amazing. Because there, a lot of them are here just to punch the church clock they just are doing the it's my christian duty they're saved they're going to heaven but there is no passion in their soul they are so bound with yokes from the world and yokes from their life and from trouble that they can't get get they won't even get at at my altar and eat and get into my presence so that that stuff can the fat as they grow it breaks the yoke off of them you want deliverance you want freedom you want change consistently be devouring at the, at the, at the feast of, of the table of the Lord if you want to be free and you want true deliverance and life change that lasts forever, that's what you do. Like David. I mean, I can just picture him. Can you imagine 14 years old, you walk in, your brothers are already there and dad says, hey, uh, this guy here thinks you might be the king. Imagine the feeling that probably came over him of like, wow, dad, you didn't even think about me? Broken, broke my heart, man, little guy here. And I'm sure there was pain because you can see it in his life, but if you look at the consistent power in his life and change in his life, it was because he was a man of the presence of God. He was a man of the word of God. That's why I bug you so much about reading your Bibles and praying. That's why people don't like to hear it anymore. I've had people leave the church because they want to just come and hear a cute message and go home and do their thing. And I'm telling you, that is not the way to walk with God and it is not the way to change the world. I want you to catch this. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, it says this. Finally, one little line. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Paul also prayed for us that we would be strengthened with might in our inner man, in our, in our spiritual man, that we'd be strengthened with might. Please hear me, what I'm about to say. If you didn't hear any part of the message, just please hear this part. 
God has an answer for the mess in your life, for your marriage, for the pain in your heart, for a city, for a nation that's lost its mind. God has an answer, and it's this. You. That you would say yes to him. Even in your brokenness, even, even in your weakness, that you would say yes to him. Because God's weapon in this day to transform and change people is a people after his heart. That is the weapon of God. Our country might never be changed. Look right here. Please hear me. I am political. How many of you ever know that about me? If you are my Facebook friend, you know that I've had to change my, literally shut down one of my Facebook accounts that had like 3,500 friends because it was just like a war. And I said, I can't do this anymore. So I started up a new one. And guess what's happening? The same thing. I'm, I, you know, I just can't keep my mouth shut. I'm very political about, about I just, I don't like where our nation's going. I just look at it and go, we're crazy. And I get worked up and the Lord says, why don't you seek me? Because the answer to the United States of America is not Donald Trump. It's not, uh, what's the other guy's name? Don't even know his name. Cruz. Cruz. It's, it's not a, a socialist. 74-year-old angry guy. And it's not some white lady that's been in politics her whole life. None of them can change our country. No. Please, hear me. I'm serious. We're like, oh, our guy got in. Oh, our party got in. Wee! And then for 40 years, we're just wrecking the place. And then we want more. And the church sits around and puts all their stock in who's going to become president. And what we really need more than that, I hope we get a good president that can help turn the country in a different direction. But I'm telling you right now, what we need, the weapon in the hand of God is an anointed people whose heart are after him who are fat. Yeah. Amen. Amen? Listen, you can spell it F-A-T if you want or P-H-A-T, however you want to spell it. I'm thinking about getting a shirt made that just says, I'm fat. I love conversation shirts like that. Just like starts a, I used to have a shirt that said, I'm a murderer on it. And people would be like, what? What's up with your shirt? I'm a murderer, man. My sins put Jesus on the cross. I killed him. And then it opens up dialogue. I wouldn't recommend that for everyone, by the way. <laughs> Don't go out. Everybody's wearing shirts from EDF. Murder! <laughs> but just fatten up. How many of you know that this is the only time we can say, I want to be fat? Yeah. We're always worried, aren't we, about our shape and our size? I see, you know, I, the one question my wife asked me, I, I will never answer in a million years. Did this make me look fat? I'm like, honey, no. You're a, you're gorgeous. You look fantastic. And then she yells at me because she says, you're lying to me. I said, no, baby, you look good. You look good. This is the one place where you can walk to people and go, man, you're getting fat. I can tell. You know how I can tell you're getting fat? Because the yolks are coming off you. You're growing to the place. You're growing free. And things are breaking because you're actually letting the word of God and the presence of God pierce your life and transform you. Do you know why the world doesn't want to, well, there's two reasons why the world doesn't want to love God. And they don't want to, a guy on Facebook, a friend of mine, uh, he wrote something and somebody from his side, uh, you know, one of his buddies criticized it and basically said nobody wants anything to do with the church now you know, for the last 30 years, and I chimed in. And I said, well, you're wrong in one place. Nobody's wanted anything to do with the church for 2,000 years because every one of the disciples were killed because of their faith. So this isn't a new thing that people are rejecting God. This isn't new. It's not like, oh, we blew it. No, this people have a tendency to not want to hear about righteousness and that they are a sinner and that they need Jesus. It, it offends their prideful flesh. But there's another reason why I think the world looks at the church and goes, I'm not sure I want in. And I think it's this. Because the world looks at the church and sees people that claim it and don't live it. 
They say it with their mouth. I'm a Christian. They have the bumper sticker and the little fish on the car. I don't have a fish on my car for a reason. Because sometimes I drive weird. <laughs> Seriously, sometimes I drive a little, I get a little sporty, you know what I mean? I get a little, I get some music on, I'm going down the freeway, boom, blow by people. I don't want people going, Christians. <laughs> Never mind, I'm not going to go there. I had a whole thing, I'll just let it go. <laughs> it's making me laugh just thinking about it, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull it back together. Get fat. Get fat. You ever been to a smorgasbord? One of those like buffet lines things? Remember those things? I, can't, I hate them things. I don't like, here's what I don't like about them. Everyone puts their hands in it. It bugs me. So you'll be there, you'll see all the food laid out. Oh, it looks amazing. And then you'll see a lady up in front of you and she's like, hmm. Oh, <laughs> uh, not having the chicken. You'll see a little kid, ha choo! And the splash is here. The splash guard is here, not here. <laughs> Poof on the food. I'm like, ah, it's over. There's one place that I've eaten where I really liked their, their buffet line. Food was good. And you know what's bad about them? You just keep going back. You just rah, 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 rah. like a wood chipper. Rah, 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 rah. And then you go, you don't even have to, you don't even have to do anything with your plate, you just leave it there. On the table, you're like, oh, I want to get back. I get a fresh plate. And you, just, and then you leave there, and you're like, oh. And then the next morning, I was just telling a buddy, I went and bought pants at the mall, which I don't like to do. I hate shopping. And I went in. I didn't even try them on because I've always had the same waist size since I was in high school. So I said, sweet, I know what to get. I brought them home last week. I went to try a pair on. I couldn't button them. Lord, how'd this happen? God, speak to me. He says, I'll tell you how it happened. You know the buffet line at the Hawaii place? You, remember when you ate the half gallon of ice cream by yourself? You want me to go on of how this happened? You know that place called Crunch? Yeah, you haven't been there. We wonder why our lives get weird and out of control and then we have to look back at the pattern and go, I haven't been at the buffet table of the Lord. I'm not spiritually fat. I'm spi this is the only place you can be fat is in the spirit. I was uh, preaching. I was preaching in little, uh, several months ago. and A lady that's a real prayer warrior came in the church and said, Pastor Rick, that's not how she talks. I don't know why I do this. <laughs> I'd make every woman sound the same. They're, they're from like New York and they're angry. No, uh, she said, I saw a picture of you when we, were, when we were worshiping. And I was like, oh no, what is it? She says, the Lord showed me your spirit. And I went, oh, well, what's up? And she goes, you were huge. Your muscle, you were like, and I was like, really? And she walked away, and I thought, oh, that's kind of cool. And the Lord said, no, 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 that's how I want my people. We spend so much time on the outside, don't we? How do I look? And to the Lord, we neglect completely the table, the feast of the Lord, prayer and the word, and being in his presence to be transformed. And then we wonder why we're bitter and angry. I read a verse last week that says this, don't let a root of bitterness spring up in you. Watch this, in you. It's the only place the Bible talks about a root coming out of you is this. Don't let a root of bitterness spring up in you because it causes trouble, watch this, and defiles many. Watch. If I'm bitter and angry at life, it's easy to find people that are bitter and angry and get them on the bitter train with me and we go for a ride and it defiles many. I know people who were not bitter. I've pastored churches where people were not angry and not, they were good with the church and they got around a couple sour people who were bitter and the next thing you know, they're on the bitter train because it defiled them. Let me give you a better answer to this. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Instead of letting your flesh run amok and the bitterness grow up inside of you and the father wounds and the mother wounds and the relational wounds 
keep you from doing what God's asked you to do. Look right here, please hear me. I'm gonna end with this. Do not pretend that God has a plan for everybody else but you. Oh, well, yeah, God would choose him because he's great. No, we're not great. We just said yes, and the Lord transform, is, is transforming us. How do you know I'm not transformed 100%? Who's hung out with me before? How do you know I'm not? I'm a dude. I was with some guys in, my, uh, in our car driving from the, I had the young guys. I take the young guys to lunch on, on the staff. I'm talking young, 18, 19, 15, those guys that are helping on the maintenance team because I like to honor and love on them because what they do is super important. So I was driving them to lunch, and this lady comes flying over in a Prius. What is it about Prius drivers? <laughs> it trips me out. I'm like, charge the battery, you know came over on me and I went like this. This is what I did with all the guys in the car. Hey, what are you doing, lady, stupid Prius? And one of the guys looks at me and goes, hmm. <laughs> I said, oh, guys, I need transformation. I need help. I need to, watch this, I need to get a little fatter to break off of me the things that don't belong. Amen? Amen. You're it. Watch this. The broken you is the chosen you. You think God's going to choose you when you get a little bit better. Oh, I'm going to get my way. Oh, oh, can I share something with you I thought about this week? It's in my devotional time. It doesn't really have to do with the message. but this. Remember when Jesus was casting demons out and they came and said, Lord, what's going on? And he said, well, when you cast a demon out of somebody, they're clean and they're swept clean. The house is swept clean. And then that spirit goes away and it'll come back to see. And then if it, it, watch this. If the house is still clean, it gets more and comes back. And I thought, well, isn't that crazy? So if we're clean, but watch this. You can be clean and not filled. Watch. I met with a young man, has a powerful testimony yesterday. He got saved a couple years ago, told me his testimony. Unbelievable. Him and his wife, transformed by the Lord. Terrible childhood, alcohol, drug abuse, in and out of all these, you know, get, get clean places. And we were talking, I said, it's amazing there are people who get clean, but never get free. They get clean, and they're not doing the drug anymore, but the inside of them is complete. And something, he said, yeah, gee, this is a great thing. He said, Jesus came to me when I gave my life to him, and he took my heart out, literally. He says, I felt like he took my heart out, and he gave me a new heart, and he put it back inside of me. He goes, now I'm not just clean and sober, but I'm clean and full of something good. And I said, bro, you're getting fat. And I shared with him the whole fat thing. I said, tomorrow when you come to church, you're going to already have heard the message. Get fat. Get fat. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, not your might. You don't get clean to take a shower. No one walks in and goes, I'm going to take a bath, and goes and takes a shower before they take a bath. He does the cleaning. He does the transforming. He does the healing. You just come to him and say, here I am, jacked up and all. And he goes, good, come here. Just like that dog, go ahead and come in because he likes you. He's for you. David found that out. Where he was rejected, he found in God unfailing love, mercy, rivers of pleasure. He found God. Amen? Let's pray. Well, Lord, we thank you for how amazing you are. I just am so grateful, God, that you would choose a broken man like me to love. To first of all, love and be a friend of. And God, and then to change my heart and, Lord, to use my life. I thank you that you've done that. But God, there's a bunch of people that sit in front of me that you want to do the same thing with. The weapon in today's society, God, is people who have a heart after you. That is the weapon. So would you draw us close as a church? Would you draw us close as individuals that we would have a heart for you and love you? With all eyes closed, I'm going to start on the far right of this room. You're right. And I just want to say this. If you're here and you've walked away from the Lord, you've given your heart to Jesus and you've walked away, or you've never given your heart to Jesus, and today you want to do that. Today is the day that you want to stop running like that dog who's hurt and broken and injured, and you want to come home to a father who will care for you. He loves you. Listen, Jesus gave his life on a cross so you could know him, so you could have relationship. That is amazing love. 
that's you, my eyes are just going to move across this audience starting far right of this room. And you want to give your heart to the Lord today, would you just raise your hand up so that I can see it? My eyes are moving through right now, coming through far right. You're right, coming through. Yep, don't hesitate. Just say yes to him. Good. Middle now. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Good. Yes, sir. Good. Yeah, coming through now. Left side, middle. You just say, I need the Lord today. Good. Far left over here. Yes, I see your hand. That's awesome. Good. All of you that raised your hands, could you just look at me for just a minute and give you a little instruction? Best decision you've ever made in your life. This awesome people that are standing to uh, your left that says, I said yes. There are, there are a, a team that just want to pray with you. They want to give you a little booklet. They want to make sure that you're okay. Nothing weird's going to happen. There's a nice, beautiful little room right there. You're just going to sit and talk. If someone brought you and you're nervous to go by yourself, bring that person with you. Just grab them. Say, come on. Come with me. Here's what I want you to do. When this song is playing at the end or when church ends, when service is over, it doesn't matter to me. You can come right now and just walk over to that side and meet them. Please hear me. This step is a huge step. This step is a massive step in your walk with God. Lord, we love you. We celebrate that you love us. And Lord, we're coming after you. We want to be after your heart like David was. Break yokes of bondage off of every person in this room right now. As we grow fat in the anointing of the Lord and in the word of God, change us in Jesus' strong name. Amen. Well, let's stand together and let's just, let's worship and get a little fatter. Amen. Let's get fat.